So now let's talk about another idea which is equally equally revolutionary. And again, if this works, again you can you know forget about the Shockley quasi limit, and solar cell would be much more efficient. And that is generating this multiple excitons, right? So so far we have agreed, or you have uh, uh, you know you have gotten used to the fact that for every incoming photon, I only generate one electron and hole pair. Right, but there's no there's no like fundamental reason why it should you know one incoming photon if it has very high energy, it should only generate uh, one electron and hole pair. So typically, what happens is that if you have this high energy photons, it generates this electron and hole pair at a very high energy, and those electron and hole they uh, interact with the lattice and they lose that energy in terms of these uh, lattice vibrations, right? So one of the ideas that you guys uh, did in your problem set was to essentially think about hard carrier cells, which could extract them before they relax. But there could be another idea, right? So instead of instead of relaxing and giving this energy to the lattice, this hard electron essentially it can give that extra energy to this electron present uh, in my conduction band, and it can excite it uh, to uh, electron present in the valence band, it can excite it uh, to the uh, conduction band, and it can generate an extra electron and hole pair, right? Specifically, if my energy of this incoming photon is greater than twice of the band gap of my uh, semiconductor material, then there is uh, there's no reason, fundamental reason at least, that you know why I cannot create more than one electron and hole pair uh, using this, uh, this high energy photon, okay? So that is the idea of uh, multiple exciton generation. That is, if you have uh, one high energy photon or one blue photon, you create two electron and hole pairs uh, using it. Okay. So people have, uh, you know, modeled this, and uh, again, this is uh, in the context of the hot electron cell. So if I had some mechanism of extracting out this electron at higher carrier temperature, then you can see that. If I have a, if I extract them only at uh, 300 Kelvin, then I get this uh, this U-shaped umbrella curve over here. But if I can extract these uh, electrons at a hotter temperature, if I can extract them before they relax, so you know, if before this this electron gets relaxed, if I can extract it out, then I could, in principle, achieve an efficiency of 67 uh, percent. So this is for the case of a uh, hot electron kind of a cell. Now, if I take the idea that instead of uh, you know instead of hot electron, let only consider those electrons which have energy greater than twice the band gap. So, if the energy of the photon is more than twice the band gap, I can essentially use it to generate uh, one electron and hole pair. That would give me this kind of a curve, or I can use to generate two electron and hole pair for each of this photon. That would give me this kind of a curve for efficiency. And if I can generate the maximum amount of electron and hole pair that I could with this high energy photon, it would give me this uh, top curve over here. So again, the efficiency, and you could you know use that same code that you wrote for your uh, problem set uh, uh, problem set one to essentially you know configure it now such that uh, for each of these photons which has energy greater than twice the band gap, it's generating. Uh, uh, it's generating more than one photon. Energy photon which has energy more, then you can further add to it a photon which has energy of more than three times the band gap. It's generating three. One which has energy more than four, it's generating four. And if you run that same code again, you'll get this efficiency of uh, these uh, uh, for these multi exciton cell to be around uh, 43 percent. Okay. <coughs> So what is the process that is used to generate this uh, multiple uh, multiple uh, uh, excitons? It's the process uh, uh, of uh, impact ionization. And in nature, it's reverse to the process of uh, OJ recombination. So when we talked about uh, different recombination process, I described to you this OJ recombination, where your electron and hole pair recombine. And they give away this uh, extra energy to this uh, another uh, electron which is uh, present over here. Okay, uh, but a reverse process of that would be essentially a photon comes in and it generates this electron and hole pair uh, with a very high energy, and this electron it essentially gives the energy to this extra 
uh, or this electron is present in the valence band and it generates uh, electron and hole pair. So both of these uh, processes are three particle processes. They involve three particles, right? So both OJ and impact ionization, they involve uh, three particles. In one case, you take three particles and reduce it to uh, reduce it to one. In the other case, you take one particle and make three particles out of it, right? So impact ionization is the mechanism uh, by which you can generate these uh, multiple excitons. Again, the reason why this does not happen uh, in nature, or you know, it's not uh, very easy to realize, is that you have all these other mechanisms which are happening uh, in your cells. So you typically have uh, uh, all this scattering mechanisms. You have phonon scattering. You have carrier-carrier scattering. So before that, uh, before that uh, electron with that higher energy, it generates, uh, it, you know, it interacts with another atom and generates this extra electron and hole pair. It usually gets scattered, or it gets scattered either by a phonon or by another uh, another carrier atom. Okay, so that's why typically to realize these uh, impact annihilation process, you need energies much higher than the band gap. So usually the rule of thumb is you need more than uh, five times the band gap. So for a silicon kind of a cell, you need to apply more than 5 volt to generate this uh, impact energy. So nobody applies 5 volt kind of a voltage. Uh, usually you don't get that high voltage out of your uh, silicon-based uh, solar cell. Right? So that's the reason why you don't see them uh, in, in practice. <coughs> now, what has happened in this field, at least in the research in this field, the researchers have moved to this idea of uh, using quantum dots to realize this uh, multiple excitation. And the reason is pretty simple. It's, uh, it's obvious from the band gap over here. So usually you have this uh, continuous band gap. But when you, get, uh, when you make this quantum dot, now you have you know, multiple of these states available over here. So instead of having just two discrete states, you have multiple states uh, available uh, inside your uh, inside your uh, device, and uh, specifically they also rely on these surface states, which are produced in these quantum dots. Because at the surface of these quantum dots, you also get uh, you know you don't have perfect termination of these bonds, and you get these surface states as well. So what you now get is like a continuous. Instead of having just uh, two discrete levels, you get these continuous levels. And now when you generate this, uh, generate this high energy uh, electron and hole pair, when they cool down, they can essentially very easily excite uh, 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 electron from the lower energy band over here. So this is, uh, again, an uh, idea that uh, at least has shown some, some uh, promise uh, in the lab. So uh, shown here is one such, uh, one such experimental uh, demonstration. So what the researchers over there have done, they have taken this uh, lead uh, selenium-based uh, nanocrystals, and these are embedded uh, inside this absorber material. And uh, uh, plotted here is the quantum efficiency, the external quantum efficiency of this cell. So you notice that when you go to lower wavelengths, especially, that means lower wavelength means blue photon, or this high energy photon, which generates this electron and hole pair at high energy. So if you do that, you see that you see a sudden jump in your quantum efficiency. So for your, for your, uh, for your normal photons, which were at lower uh, uh, wavelengths, you are getting a quantum efficiency of 10%. Uh, but when you use this uh, higher energy photon, you are getting uh, you know, a multiple or four or five times uh, in your quantum efficiency. What that means is that now this higher energy photon is multiplying and it's generating, uh, it's generating more than one electron and hole pair. Okay? And then people have demonstrated them, um, you know, at quantum efficiency of more than more than 100 percent. You know, in fact, more than uh, 200, 300 percent using uh, both nanocrystal and nanowires of these uh, these materials. Okay, so this is a this is a uh, at least a, a concept which uh, looks uh, promising. Um, uh, that you know, a lot of research. Uh, there are a few groups in Stanford who are working on this as well. Okay. So this is one such uh, one such uh, demonstration where usually you only generate uh, one electron and hole pair. Uh, you know, one electron and hole uh, uh, for each of the photons. 
But now when people have started to use this, uh, this nanocrystal or these nanowires uh, of these, uh, some of the semiconductor materials, you see that your quantum efficiencies, they are much higher than 100%. And there are, you see steps over here, each of them corresponds to a multiplication of your uh, career. So uh, quantum efficiency of 300% means that for each of that incoming photon, you multiply it and you generate three electron and one pairs. Okay? So these are, you know, these are ideas uh, which are at least uh, being explored uh, in research. And none of them is, you know, close to commercialization yet. But if if they do, then they would be, you know, disruptive if if it does happen. So now let me check, you know, or maybe you can suggest more ways. So what I've described is, you know, you can equate these kind of things into either an up conversion of photons or a down conversion of photons. So specifically, uh, people who are electrical engineering background, they love you know, these kind of terms, up conversion, down conversion. Right? So among the two ideas, or the couple of ideas we discussed, so up conversion means I take uh, two of this uh, red photons, and they combine to give me a photon which is of uh, 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 you know, I take two of these carriers, two of these electron and hole pairs, or two of these photons at lower energy, and I combine them to give me a photon at higher energy, or give me an electron and hole pair at higher energy. The other idea is down conversion, that I take two of these low energy electron and hole pair, and I combine them to make, you know, a higher energy electron and hole pair. So, you know, give, so among the ideas we discussed, which one is up conversion, which one is down conversion. And if you guys have more ideas, you know, you're welcome to describe them. So, you know, for a few things we discussed, right? We discussed multiple exciton generation. We discussed uh, intermediate, uh, intermediate cell. Okay, maybe we discussed even thermophotovoltaics. Which category do they fall in? Uh, intermediate is up, so I should place intermediate here because it's combining it's combining this uh, two lower energy photons to give me a higher energy electron holder. Okay. Uh, what do you guys think about multiple exciton generation? And what do you think? Down is when you take a higher energy, um, um, higher energy photon and convert it into two electron and hole pairs which are at lower energy. Okay. And uh, okay. So in terms of uh, how about thermophotovoltaic? So. And everybody clear, you know, a multiple exciton generation, it takes this higher energy photon and uses it to generate two of these, uh, two of these electron and hole pair, right? How about thermophotovoltaic? Does it fall under any of this category? Or? What are you guys think? Down. Okay. It's actually not classified as up and down, but I would incline to call it down because you're essentially taking that spectral selective element and giving back all the all the higher energy photons back to the sun or back to their local sun and only taking the lower energy photons. So you could call it down conversion. Okay. You guys have any more ideas how to do this up and down conversion? Yeah, so one more idea that people are use that for both up and down conversion is actually using these uh, chemical dyes. And what you, these dyes, how they work, again, I'm, I'm, 
I must admit that I don't have a very good chemistry background, but in principle, they essentially take these, uh, these are these molecules which take these individual photons and then up convert or down convert them. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a professor over here in material science, Justin uh, Jennifer Doan, who works on it. She works on these uh, uh, dyes which does these up and down conversion for uh, photons. So there are, other ways as well to do this up and down conversion, and um, you know, all of them are trying to exceed this shortly quasar limit. So, in principle, you know, one thing I want you to carry home from this course is that this ideal black body radiation is not the best for for solar energy conversion. If I, you know, if I, that's why you know, our planet, as you look at it, right, it's not the sun we have, the earth, the way this earth. The way we have designed our city was like in a very inefficient manner, right? If if you were redesigning this world now, you wouldn't make cities where they are right now, right? You would make it close. The cities right now are closer to the ports, right? How many people use ports nowadays, right? You would right to like to design them more closer to the energy resources. Similarly, if I could redesign this planet, I would design my son to have, you know, a, 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 a spectral which looks like this, right? So I could convert it with a very high efficiency. But most of the efficiency limits are, are because I essentially convert this with a very low efficiency, this part of the spectrum, and I convert the convert the tail, which is the uh, lower energy photons. I basically don't absorb them, right? So. All the ideas we have discussed, multi-junction, the ideas we discussed today, um, multiple exciton generation or intermediate cells, they're all trying to essentially you know, live with this, this kind of sun that we have been given and try to absorb the spectrum more effectively, okay? <clears throat> so what we have covered in this course is, is, is a tiny, you know, tiny part, this PV part of, of, of the whole uh, game. I try to give you a flavor of this thermo photovoltaic part and this uh, solar thermal part, but there are you know many ways to convert this uh, solar energy uh, into um, into electricity. There's uh, of course the photovoltaic part, there's the solar thermal part, there's the thermo photovoltaic part, then there's thermoelectric, the Stirling engine. So there are a wide variety of systems uh, that uh, you can use. Okay. <coughs> 